as a person might cover up a wound with its own eroded skin. He rose to his full height and possessed himself of the candle. His knees ceased to knock together, his pulses ceased their frantic tattoo. The beads of sweat on his forehead began to dry. <clears throat> there was a curious phase in the pitiful evolution of temptation, when the insane desire sinks down and sinks in, and the practical resolution of what we are going to do hardens and crystallizes in all the veins and fibers. There is no longer now any localized, central stir in the person's being. All is diffused. All is spread out through body, soul, and spirit. The man does not only want to do this abominable thing with his wrought-up sex nerve, he wants to do it with his whole nature. The sex nerve is still at the bottom of it. But that nerve of imaginative evil, now so quietly coiled up, only its little radium-burning eye of glacier-livid tint, crossed by flickering red leaven, remaining alert, only its forked tongue quivering like a compass needle, has projected its dynamite, dynamic energy through the whole organism, has converted the whole organism into its obedient slave so that its immediate functioning can lie latent. And the most dangerous aspect of this diffused energy, which now fills the man's whole nature, so that his intellect is inspired by it, and his soul is inspired by it, and his spirit is inspired by it, is its deadly cunning. That little coiled-up nerve snake, now suddenly grown so innocently quiescent, that if Mr. Evans were to strip himself naked, there would have been nothing indecent in the exposure, gathered the dynamic energy which had spread through his whole being directly from the first cause, capital F, capital C. In the nature of the first cause, there are two windows of manifestation corresponding most precisely to the eyes of such creatures as have no more than two eyes. From one of these slits into the infinite pours forth good, from the other evil. When Spinoza taught that the will of God was limited by the nature of God, he was not deducing some such doctrine from his intimate experience, but from his mathematical reason. Intimate experience of reality, whether it be the experience of the first cause or of any one of its innumerable creatures, is always reporting magic, mystery, and miracle. And along with these, an unbounded faith in the power of the will to change the nature of the organism. The whole stream of what is called evolution depends on this auto-creativeness of living things. Nor is there any creature that does not share with the first cause the power of being good or being evil at its own intrinsic will. It is the created, not the creator, who so constantly produce good out of evil. And this they do of their absolute free will. Certain created souls have indeed willed the good rather than the evil so habitually, and these souls are not confined to the human race, that they have rendered themselves impervious to the evil eye of the first cause, and porous only to the eye of infinite compassion. The Mr. Evans, who now issued forth from Number Two's basement and blew out his candle at the top of those narrow stairs, was a Mr. Evans whose will, for that crisis in his life, was entirely evil, and whose cunning craftiness in the achievement of his outrageous intention was supernatural in its flexibility. I forget if I told you, Mr. Jones he said, pulling on his tight black overcoat with twenty times the ease with which he had pulled it off, for no overcoats, no fur-tipped jackets either, slip on so quite quickly as the ones that are destined for a wicked quest. That I've got an appointment this morning with Father Paleologue. Aye, what's that? Do you mean you're going, sir? Father Paleologue. You will remember him if you think a little. He brought a collection of icons to sell for his monastery. 
A Greek monkey is. Catholic monks are discouraged from coming here. Their authorities know, by a secret tradition of scholastic warning, what the twilight year Iquid really means to which the grail leads. Number two stared at him. Pardon me, marm, he murmured to the lady he was waiting upon. I've had a very few of the high cones in my shop, he went on speaking quietly and earnestly to Mr. Evans. Do you think <clears throat> there'll be a big enough demand for such things as they to make it worth our... But Mr. Evans was already taking down his bowler hat from the peg where it always rusted. I'll bring you back a couple of my pocket to show you, Mr. Jones, and I'm sure you'll agree. The truth was that number two, although no bad judge of a portrait of John Locke, when he saw one, had never seen an icon and had not the faintest notion what such a thing looked like. But Mr. Evans had opened the street door and was gone, while old Jones, turning to his customer with an air of confiding all the eccentricities of his partner to an, her intelligent ear, said something about the study of high cones being one of those branches of his profession that he never aspired to. Do you happen to have picked up a few of them on your travels, ma'am? While the lady stared at this curious purveyor of rarities, number two's partner, with some distance down the street, walking very fast towards the cattle market. When he reached the entrance of Dickory Cantle's tavern, he opened the door marked Tap a little way and peeped in. The tap room was full of beer drinkers and the air was thick with smoke. Mrs. Cantle, a pale, worn-out woman, was serving at the bar, assisted by her son Elfin. Mr. Evans opened the door a little further and remained hesitating. The small place was so crowded, for it was a favorite resort among those of the Glastonbury unemployed who could lay hands on a penny or two, that neither Mrs. Cantle nor Elfin, nor indeed anyone in the room, noticed that hooked nose and those gleaming eyes under the bowler hat, snuffling and peering in the entrance like the devil at Arborock's cellar. Backward and forward went the thin white arm of Mrs. Cantle above the counter. To and fro went the thin, frail figure of Elfin among the little tables in front of the wooden seats. It must have been a scene that, with certain trifling differences in cut of costume and tone of voice, went back to the time when Glastonbury was a medieval town of no small importance. There was not a man here this morning among these drinkings, who had not come to forget his troubles. And there was not a man among all these men who had not already realized that purpose is the thick, smoke-filled air with that strong smell of beer and cheese and masculine sweat. The present dictators of Glastonbury, that is to say Dave Spear, Paul Trent, and Red Robinson, would of a surety never have dared officially to interfere with the national regulations about the closing hours of public houses. But when once the local police force, represented in this case by Bob Shepard, had received a hint in favor of greater laxidity from the mayor of the town, it became easy for the smaller taverns like St. Michael's on Chilkwall Street and Dickery's at the cattle market to admit a group of habitual customers while keeping their blinds down and their shutters closed. Such a group this morning, then, at a time when the public bar at the Pilgrims' was authentically shut, was enjoying itself after the fashion of their ancestors and talking loudly about the new commune. No one took the least notice of the gaunt, bowler-headed individual hesitating in the doorway and scarching searching the room with an eye of wild expectancy. Apparently he found what he wanted, for he gave vent to a sudden sound between a laugh and a groan. His hesitation came at once to an end now. Closing the door very softly behind him, he moved through the smoke in the noisy crowd, past the little tables and the wooden benches, till he reached the counter. 
Here he stood in complete silence till he caught the landlady's eye. Good morning, Mr. Heavings, said Mrs. Cantle in a faint voice. Have you come about what dickery do old old Jones for a thick second and bend and they off a dozen bedroom chairs? Let's see if we can decipher this. Have you come about what dickery do owe old Jones for the second and bed and they are a dozen bedroom chairs? Certainly not, ma'am, muttered Mr. Evans. I've come, I've come for, I've come to have a drink and look about a bit. What are you taking, Mr. Evings? Straight scotch or a peg of our special? Since neither she nor her husband ever touched a drop of what they sold, this latter alternative was understood by everyone in the room to refer to a brand of liquor, more potent even than Mother Legs Bridgewater Punch, which had mellowed for generations in a great butt in the famous Cantle cellar. The truth was that our special was a species of old sack that the years had converted into a liquid gold that was heady and hardening to a degree unparalleled, save perhaps by the contents of one of the great historic casks at Bremen. Only the boldest visitors paid their half a crown for a sip of this ancestral fire water, and a spot of color came into the hollow cheeks of the thin lady when Mr. Evans, ignorant of the formality of this offer, murmured his preference for the select beverage. Us can't afford to treat it to him, Mr. Evings. Thee dost know that, don't thee? As a reply to this, the tall Welshman put his hand into his pocket and produced a big handful of loose silver. Will that pay for a double glass, ma'am? he inquired. She gave him one of those quick, nervous looks that women of all classes are in the habit of giving when in the presence of some striking evidence of masculine extravagance. "'Twould pay for a three times over,' she said. "'Give me just that, please, Mrs. Cantle, a three times over.' I bain't responsible, Mr. Heavings, if a three times of our special sends the stomach into the head. The smile, if it could be called a smile, with which the unfortunate man replied to this warning, awed the woman into obedience. To will cost thee the best of ten shillings, she said solemnly, as she turned to give the order to Elfin. Elfin had been gazing in mute wonder for some while at this unusual customer. "'Twill be a full tumbler, mother,' he whispered. "'Will Dad be angry?' "'Do as I be telling ye, Elf. "'The gentleman knows what it be. "'Tisn't for we to say not "'if he pours a sovereign's worth down the throat.' "'While Elfin was away on this mission, "'and his mother was once more serving his "'her more normal customers with beer,' Mr. Evans moved slowly to a wooden bench at the back of the room where the person was seated for whose presence at that place he had been hoping against hope. This person was none other than Finn Toller. The sandy-haired codfin was sitting alone with an empty flagon in front of him, gazing vacantly into the smoke-filled atmosphere. Watery as usual were his staring blue eyes within their red circles, and the pale hairs of his eyelashes showed round these rims like the white bristles of a young pig. Hmm, I don't look like that. While his underlip hung down like the lobe of a monstrous purple snapdragon. A good day, Codfin, remarked Mr. Evans. So it be, mister. I were just thinking there might be rain afore night, but I hope not. I've a deal to do today, one day and the other. Do you feel when you have anything to do, Codfin, that everything's unreal, that people and everything, till you've got it done? The man gave him a sudden quick look, for the tone of this voice was queer. Some people be afraid to sit by I, mister, but you bain't scared a little old cotty, be I? Perhaps you've given them reason to be afraid of you. 
Again, the queer tone. Mr. Tollock's experienced the uncomfortable sensation that he got sometimes when he woke up at two o'clock in the night. Red Robinson be death sick with fear when he do see I coming. The other day I turned clean round and showed his bleeding arse sooner than for we to meet. How do you account for the, his doing that, Codfin? said Mr. Evans with burning eyes. Don't know. I have done nothing to him. Oh, yes, you have, Coffin. Oh, yes, you have. As I was telling you in the place before, you and I are linked together in the movements of the stars, and when you come to do what you want to do, I'll do what I want to do. Tyler's gaze drew itself away from vacancy and became the expression of a rabbit contemplating a weasel. What do you know about it, mister? A good deal, Codvin, more than you guess, and that's because we're in the same boat. You'll be laughing at a poor working man, Mr. Evans. Not at all, Codvin. Do you want my hand on it? There, there, good luck to you. In the same boat. That's we at where we are, Finn Toller, my friend. Elf Cantle's eyes nearly started, started out of his head when approaching the little table in front of the two men. With the tumbler of pallid gold in his hand, he saw them shaking hands. Mother says tis ten shillings is, sir, if you please, he whispered as he put her special down. It was Mr. Toller's turn to look surprised when he saw the great handful of silver emerge from his companion's trouser pocket. Well, I guess I should end now. I'm getting into it, though. But I don't want to go on for 30 minutes. Or do I? Nah, I won't. All right. Well, that's uh, glad some break for today. Hope I remember what's going on. Till next time, see you from here.